I know everyone's having great conversations, and I, I almost hate to interrupt those. But if I can draw your attention back to the sanctuary. I don't know if you guys noticed, but last week I gave an eight-minute video instead of a five-minute because we tend to use all of the five-minute break, and so I gave us a longer video last week. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to join me in the Old Testament. We're going to start off in 2 Kings chapter 5 today. Um, I'm launching into a, a different sermon series that I've put together here uh, where we're talking about some of the heroes and villains in the Bible, and we're going to take a look at a, a, a few of each in that category, some of the heroes uh, and some of the villains. And today we're going to uh, launch into a, uh, a new passage of Scripture, maybe a more obscure passage of Scripture where we don't uh, reference it all that often, but nonetheless there is deep spiritual impact for us in this passage of Scripture. So 2 Kings chapter 5, and while you're turning there, just let me ask this question. Have you ever felt like things are not quite what they seem? Um, let me give you an illustration, a story. This story is a true story. It didn't happen to me or even anyone I know, but I, I, I read the source. It's a true story. So the story goes like this. One day, uh, this woman was coming home <clears throat> from her job, and she, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm messing the story up. One morning, a man was getting ready to go to work, and his wife was also getting ready to go to work, and she asked her husband if he could help her zip up her dress in the back. And so he, he starts helping her zip up the dress in the back, but being a husband and a wife, he decides to flirt a little bit, and he messes around, so he starts unzipping it again. And then he zips it back up, and then he unzips it. He's kind of messing with her, and the zipper breaks. And so, of course, all of the flirtation uh, is, is gone at that moment. Now the wife is mad, and she starts stressing because she had an uber early appointment, and she had laid out her clothes to be ready for that, and he messed it all up, and she, she just was upset. So she quickly changes into some other clothes, and she heads out the door in a huff. She comes home from work later that day, and as she pulls into the garage, uh, or is pulling up towards the garage, she notices uh, underneath their car uh, the blue jean legs of, of her husband laying there on the ground underneath the car. And so she walks up to him, and just messing around, she gets the zipper of his pants, and she yanks it down and yanks it up and yanks it down and yanks it up and says, how do you like that? And then she walks in the house, just, you know, kind of getting even for him breaking her zipper. She walks in the house, and there stands her husband with two glasses of lemonade. And she kind of freaks out. <laughs> and he's like, what is going on? And she explained what had just happened. And he says, oh, oh. He goes, uh, I was pulling in the driveway when I came home, and my muffler scraped on the curb, and the neighbor offered to climb under the car and fix that. And so that was him. So they go out there, and she begins to apologize. And she is just pleading her case of ignorance on the situation and all of this. And he just lays there, and there's no response. And so they are waiting for any type of response, and there's nothing. So finally, the husband gets down there, and he is out cold. And so they pull him out. And uh, after they revive him, they find out that uh, when she had grabbed a hold of his zipper and yanked it back and forth, he panicked. Um, and not realizing wh or remembering where he was, he tried to sit up. And he bashed his head on the bottom of the transmission of <laughs> the car <laughs> and passed out. Things aren't always what they seem. In this passage of Scripture, we're going to take a look at someone in the Scripture, and, and I'll leave it up to you to determine if they are in the hero list or in the villain list of this week's, but we're going to take a look at this individual and their story and the way things play out. Uh, there is actually not just one, but there's several moments where things are not exactly what they may initially seem to be. So let's take a look. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we read these words. Now Nahum, or Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. And he was a, vil a vigilant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said, 
to her mistress one day, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of this leprosy. Naaman went to his master and he told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram said. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of leprosy. Now as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and he said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent his message to him saying, Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry, and he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And so he turned and he went off in a rage. And Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, Wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. And as the man of God had told him, his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God And he stood before him and he said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Father God, we come to you today and I just, I pray that you would open your word to us, that we would hear your spirit in this, that we would see your nature, God, and and that we would draw close to it. God, whatever it is that you would have for us, every man, woman, and child in this place, God, we, we want your Holy Spirit to do your work in our heart, in our mind, and in our soul. And so, God, help us to hear your words and not my own. And, God, help us to uh, be obedient to your word and, and to walk in it, God. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. And I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, imagine this. Take yourself out of this story for just a minute because there's some details here that maybe we miss in our culture today. But imagine this. Imagine that you just graduated from the university, right, Lizzie? You just graduated from the university. And you're intelligent and you're soon employed by a big and famous company. And you did well and you get promoted several times. And over time, uh, a CEO of the company, business continues to expand and everything is going great. You have made a name for yourself. And you're smart, you're famous, you're rich, and then one day you feel a pain in your body. It's terminal, is what the doctor tells you. You're devastated, of course, and so uh, all the success of the past seems to mean nothing anymore because there's nothing you can do to overcome this issue. And so you seek out any doctors, all doctors, and the response is always the same. There's nothing more we can do. And all of the fame and riches does not matter. You just want to stay alive. That's actually more the idea of what's going on with Naaman. We read his story a little bit. He's similar. He was a commander of a Syrian army. And if you don't follow history, let me just enlighten you with this. In this era of history, the Syrian army was the force to be reckoned with in the, in the entire world. It was the force. And he was a commander in that. And the verse 1 of this passage of Scripture says, A great man... Is, is the descriptor in the sight of his master, the king, and he was highly regarded. He has a great reputation. He has the fame to go with it. He's a great leader. He's won many battles, it tells us in the scripture here, and he's, he's doing everything. He is at the peak, the pinnacle of what his whole existence was up until then. But there's this one problem, leprosy. There's this one disease that he can't fix 
and no doctor he has gone to seek out can do anything for it. There is nothing that can be taken care of. And we read in this story of a unique situation. And I just want to pause, and even as this person would seem like uh, maybe an unlikely hero, if, if we put him in that category, uh, we, we see in this the plan and the path that God wants to draw for each of us. And and so hang with me just for a minute. I want to explain some of these details because here's the thing. You and I can relate to the situation of Naaman because the sin sickness of this world has infected all of us. And there is literally nothing you can do about it except for the grace of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means you. That means me. That means anyone you bump into. That is true. We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, And the wages of sin is death. The cost is death. But, but, the gift of God is everlasting life. And so, as we can relate to the name and situation of the sin sickness, we also can relate to the fact that there may be this chance of having healing. And I want us to take a look at that for just a few moments. Now, of course, you guys know me well enough to know that I love history, and I love to explain history. Uh, Wednesday night Bible study, I had to kind of chuckle because um, I really felt in my brain that they, as in the rest of the people at the Wednesday night Bible study, had had prompted me to go here. And after, what, a 15, 20-minute diatribe, they brought me back and said, nope, we didn't, we didn't lead you there at all. I just started on church history and the way that the scriptures were formed, and I was like, I was going to town on it, and then I was getting more and more passionate about it, and, they, and I'm like, how did we get here? <laughs> but in this passage of scripture, we find Naaman, and he is, he is a commander, and he is, he is successful. We've already established that, but he has this leprosy issue, and so I find it interesting in the details, even as we begin with all of this, there's nothing he can do about it. Matter of fact, it, we almost seem to, to feel here in the scripture that he's kind of given up even trying. The leprosy is just who he is now. And then in verse 2, we read about this girl who is a servant. She is a slave in his house. He, this girl serves his wife and, and, and watches, uh, you know, takes care of the details in her life. And, and, and she responds, you know, if, if Naaman would just go and seek out this man of God that is in our land, he would be well. So Naaman, he tells the king about it, and the king is like, absolutely go. And this is where it gets really interesting to me, because the king sends a letter to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel's response is exactly the response I would have, by the way. Um, You want me to do what? Uh, I'm not God. I can't make you live or die. I can't heal you. And and that's the king's response. But then then we find Elisha. Elisha sends to the king and says, send him my way. We're going to prove that there's God, that there is a God and that he is the God of Israel. And so he goes, Naaman goes. And in in this situation, understand, I don't know if you gathered the details. Naaman, he shows up at Elisha's house. He shows up with a lot of pomp. There's horses and chariots specifically mentioned. There is a whole entourage that is with him. There is no way that Elisha has missed this approaching. There is no way that he is unaware of it. And yet what we find is that Elisha stays in the house. He doesn't go out and talk to him. He doesn't even see him. He just sends a servant and says, hey, go tell him to go take a bath. I mean, that's really what's in the passage of Scripture, right? And, I, and if I'm Naaman, I'm sitting there going, he, he, he's not even coming out and talking to me myself, and I'm like this big dude that's important, and he won't even bother to come out and talk to me. So Naaman, he's upset about that, but then, take it a step further, he's saying, go take a bath in a river. Don't you think Naaman's tried washing the leprosy off? Don't you think he has tried in some body of water, whether it's a river in Damascus or whatever, to, to wash his, the, the disease away? And it has not worked. And we almost see the slight uh, getting the better of Naaman. He goes away angry, verse 11 says. He leaves angry. He says, you know, I expected him to come out and wave his hands over me. You know, kind of do the, 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 the weird spiritual thing. That's what I was expecting. I mean, that's kind of his words there. I'm not making that up too much. 
Okay? I expected him to wave his hand over the spot and to cure me. And he wants me to go dip in this river. And, and I'm telling you, I've seen the Jordan River. It's not real beautiful. There's this river uh, back in Damascus, the Far Par River, or however you say that one. That river, that would be better. And then his, his servants, they try to convince him, wait a minute, if he had told you to do something great, something amazing, you would have done it. So why not do this, the simple thing? Go and wash. And he does. He's made well. He's healed. But here's the simple truth in that passage of Scripture. As I've just kind of looked at that for just a moment, there is this need for us in our sin sickness. There is this need for us if we want to become heroes instead of villains. There is this need for us to seek God. And not just, and hear me, uh, some of you even checked out, even as I say that, seek God, because I don't mean just coming to Him in, 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 on a surface level. There's more to it than that. But there is this overwhelming need for us to seek God. The truth is, and, and I think you'll recognize this as truth, the truth is, is that God is already here in the world. He's everywhere. We, we, we call it omnipresent, right? He is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And yet, we need to seek Him. Why? If He's everywhere, why do we need to seek Him? Because God doesn't force Himself on you. God doesn't force himself on me. He, he waits for us to find him and, and to seek him. And so uh, just in this passage of Scripture, understand this, that Nahum, he is at, at, at the very end of what he can do. And, and then there is word that there is this guy who has a relationship with a God that might be able to do something. And I say a God because that's how Nahum would have viewed it. And so he's probably sitting there going, yeah, let's go check it out. He begins to seek. He begins to seek so that he can find something, hoping, hoping that he might find something. A few years back, my uh, family, we went to the Shenandoah Valley in, in Virginia. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. It is beautiful country, absolutely. And we, we came across this place, it's uh, these caverns. And we go down, we're like 180 some feet below the ground level in these caverns, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. And there's uh, vastness there that you just don't expect. You get down in there and it opens up into these 30-foot tall uh, corridors uh, that are just naturally there and they're beautiful and, and everything. And then as we walk along the path, you look back and the motion lights kick off after the crowd has passed a certain spot. And you look and it is absolutely void. There is nothing there. And then the, the tour guide starts telling the story on how those caverns were found. In the 1800s, these two boys were out playing in the field, and they found a hole in the ground. And they realized it was pretty big, and so they decided to climb down in there. And they had climbed almost 100 feet down before they chickened out and said, okay, we've gone far enough, using just a candle for light. And I bring that up to say this. If they had only gone another 20 feet, they would have actually opened up into the largest area in those caverns. And it's, it's got these huge rock formations that are just absolutely gorgeous and it's kind of famous in that area for that. And, and they went down there seeking, hoping to find something. They didn't know what. They just found this hole and what could it lead to. And they went down in there and, and hoping to find something. And, and in the same way, we need to be brave enough to seek God in all that it means but unlike these two boys seeking in this cavern, we need to understand that our seeking is not in vain, that there is actually something there for us to find. And it's much better than a cavern. It's much better than a cave. Psalm 9 verse 10 says, Those who know your name, God, will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. That's a pretty good promise. God himself is telling us that he never forsakes those who seek him. Or Psalm 34, 10 says it this way. It's actually one of my favorite psalms. It says, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Or again, we find it in the New Testament. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 7, part of the Sermon on the Mount, he says in verses 7 and 8, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For anyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door is opened. And of course, there's the very famous one in Revelation where Jesus 
stands at the door and knocks. And if anyone hears my voice, he will open the door and I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. But all of that said, in our lives today, we get so caught up in just that, life. We get so caught up in in going to school. We get so caught up in doing the job. We get so caught up in the family activities. We get so caught up in running the errands and, and making all of these things happen that we forget that in our everyday life that we need to remember to seek Him. Wait a minute, Pastor Stephen, I've already sought God, I've already started a relationship with Him, and that happened years ago, and and, and that's all taken care of. I would actually argue that God wants us to seek Him continually. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says, If anyone, this is Jesus speaking to His disciples, who have been with Him for almost three years by this point in time, had walked on water, had had watched Him multiply bread and fish and feed 5,000, they had watched all of these different things happen from blind people being cured and leprosy taken care of to even the dead raised again. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus turns to His disciples and He says, If anyone would come after Me, Modern terminology, if anyone wants a relationship with me, you must daily deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Those are the words of Christ to his disciples. There is this need for us to seek him daily. And let me tell you, I personally have experienced that. I, I, you know, I grew up in church, as I've already stated. I started attending church nine months before I was born. And, and as, as a result, you know, I, I, I know the Bible pretty well before I was even an adult. And, and my dad is a pastor. And I, I promise you, I probably went to the altar at least 500 times before I was 18 years old. Because if there was a call, I felt like I needed to go. You know, and I'm, I'm, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but the truth of it is, is I've been around the church my whole life, but also this truth remains. That though I can tell you exactly when I gave my heart to Christ and it meant something to me, and though I can point to that one day and how awesome that is, I also, as I've walked life's journey, realize that I also need to seek Him daily. Because when I start to feel like, oh, I've got this, I can handle it. Sin creeps up in my life. And when I start to think that I've got it all taken care of and that that everything's good and that I've mastered this whole Christianity thing, man, it's right then that I find out that I have no clue. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, take heed, at least when you think you stand, that's when you fall. So just simply saying, Naaman, he comes seeking what God might do in his life. He's hoping I don't think he's hoping with much expectation from what we gather in his response here, but he's coming to God, seeking him, hoping that God might do something. And we, in our own lives, we need to come to this spot where we realize that seeking God is more than just that one time at youth camp way back when. It's more than just that great concert somewhere where we gave our heart to God. It's more than that one altar experience, but that we need to be seeking God daily. That we need to be in fellowship with him and finding him because when we are in right relationship with God, that's when he does amazing things. And when I say amazing things, I'm not talking about parting waters, although that's pretty amazing. I'm not talking about feeding 5,000, although that's pretty amazing. I'm talking about the most amazing thing, and that is the forgiveness of your sin. That is the doing away of our guilt. That is the paying the price we cannot And so as we seek God in this passage of Scripture, I also want to say that we also find that we have a need to submit to God. Because once you find Him, we need to submit to what God is doing. More specifically, submit to His way of doing things. Because therein lies the conundrum. Many people seek God, and then they walk away disappointed. We find this in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, as well as real life. We find it all of the time that people, we forget to submit to God. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. But in that passage of Scripture, in Psalm 119, verses 1 through the end of it, what you find is eight Eighteen times the psalmist tells us to submit to God. Eighteen times in one chapter of the Bible, we are reminded how much we need to submit and obey the commands of God. 
In John chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus, he's, he's leading the disciples out. They, they've left the upper room. They've had the last supper, if you will. They're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to be arrested. And, and they're going through this vineyard. And in verse 10, he says to his disciples, and, and, and I'm going to put emphasis on one word for just a moment. He says, if, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. See, Jesus, he's addressing his disciples right before his arrest, right before his crucifixion. He is just saying to them, one last reminder, guys, I'm about to leave you. You need to obey the word of God. You need to obey God and and his truth. You need to obey the commands that I have shared with you. You need to, to listen to what I've taught you and apply it to your life. And see, that is the number one conundrum in the church of today is that the people view the church as full of hypocrites or, 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 or a fakeness. And the reason for that is because we want to claim, we want to seek God, if you will, on the outside, but we don't want to submit to his way of doing things. In Proverbs, we're told that his ways are not our ways. And that his ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts, they're not our thoughts. And his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And, and so when we try to do things the way that we want to do them, what we find is that we're actually falling far short of what God's plan is. Because his plan is much greater if we will just submit to his way of doing it. In this passage of scripture, we're looking at Naaman. And he comes up to the, to the man of God who has a reputation of healing people. He has traveled all of this way at great expense, hoping that there's a chance that maybe something could happen in his life. And he's given specific instructions and he goes away angry. Why? Because he does not want to submit to this way. He has to be talked into it. And when he finally says, okay, all right, fine, we'll just do it. We'll, we'll go there. We'll go to the Jordan. We'll dip in. We'll do, Okay. When he finally submits to the way, that's when God moves. Now, I don't think there was anything special about the Jordan River. There were many people with leprosy that went to the Jordan River, River at many different parts of history. And it didn't cure them, to my knowledge, uh, 100%. It's, it's just not there. However, I think that maybe God wanted Nahum to get this instruction to reveal the heart of Nahum. That Nahum would realize in this that there is a need to submit to whatever God wants. I think God instructed him in this way through Elisha the prophet so that you and I would know that when we try to work things out in our own way and when things don't make sense and we don't understand it, if God is leading in that direction, it's still the best way. And we need to submit to that. Because Like Nahum said, hey, there's a lot of great rivers in the world. Why can't I go wash in any of those? But it wasn't God's plan. In our own life, there are times when we have a plan and we have a purpose and we have goals and we have things that we want to accomplish. And I just want to say, and those things aren't wrong, but I just want to say, is it God's way? Are we submitting to his plan? In 1 John chapter 5, Verses 3 and 4, John says this, this is love for God. Are you ready for it? He's about to define. What is love for God? He says, this is love for God, to obey his commands, period. That's a full sentence in your scripture. John, the one whom God loved. John, the the one who who is in Jesus' inner circle. He says, this is what loving God is all about. Are you ready for it, church? Obey his commands. That's it. That's as simple as it goes. Obey his commands. And his commands, oh, by the way, they're not burdensome. Finishing the verses here. They're not burdensome. For anyone uh, born of God overcomes the world, and this is victory. Overcoming the world, even in our faith. And so John, he's saying, listen, if you want to know what relationship with God is all about, you want to know what loving God is all about, it's simple. It's obeying him. And that's not even a hard thing to do, is what John's saying. His commands are not burdensome. It may seem like it because we have our own agenda. You know, we, we want to do things a certain way, and so it seems like his commands can be kind of burdensome to give up this or to do that or to, you know, get out of my comfort zone and go and talk to this person or whatever. But when we do it, we find that there is, it's really not that difficult. And what we find is that God blesses the situation and it far outweighs the cost. It far outweighs the cost. 
So understand, in this passage of Scripture, as we look at this new hero to the faith, we understand that at the beginning, he was reluctant to submit to God's way. And at that point, he's not a hero yet. But he becomes a hero or someone that God can use when he finally submits to God and says, okay, God, your way, your plan, I'm all in. The next piece in this is understanding that when we seek God, we will find. Understanding that when we find God, we need to obey His commands and submit to His way and to walk in in the direction that He would lead. But then understand that there is something that comes after that. And that is simply this, that we will be transformed. That's what takes place. Nahum, he's not a great guy before this. I mean, he's a good guy, but he's not a great guy. Or maybe I should phrase it this way. He's a successful guy, but he's not a man of God. And then this thing happens, and he bucks the system, and he fights against it, but when he finally submits to God, he is healed, one, that's actually a sidebar. What's more important is his final exclamation, there is no God in the world except this God. He's transformed. His entire way of thinking is transformed. His entire way of doing is transformed. And you know what? That's not the only time that this takes place. Matter of fact, when we seek God and find, when we submit to his way and we follow him, what we find is that it happens every time that he transforms us. He changes us, not in a bad way, but actually in an amazing way. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says it this way, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We don't have to let the world dictate to us who we should be, but rather we can allow God to renew our minds and make us into His image, to make us His sons and daughters. In Second Corinthians, Paul says it this way in verses five, or sorry, chapter five, verse seventeen. He says, "Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is now a new creation. The old is gone; the new has come. There is a change that needs to take place." Or Ephesians chapter four, verses twenty-two through twenty-four says it this way: "You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness." Aside from those passages of scripture, let me just jump into one that maybe fleshes this out a little bit better. In, in John chapter three. Not John 3.16, the verse that everyone has memorized. But in John chapter 3, before we get to that verse, in the middle of the night, this man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Now, he's a Pharisee, which means he's got the entire Scripture memorized. He knows who God is. He knows what God has to say. He knows the story of Nahum really well. And any other story in that Old Testament, he understands God. And he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night because he doesn't want to approach him in the daytime because of what it might look like. And he comes to Jesus and says, listen, we know you're a good teacher. And we know that God must have his hands in it because no one can do what you're doing. And I'm sitting there when I read that scripture and I'm saying, so what's your question, Nicodemus? He never asks Jesus a question. But Jesus responds and says, You, Nicodemus, need to be born again. Now Nicodemus asks a question, what do you mean? Um, I'm not going back in my mom's womb. That's just not going to happen, and and it never will. And so what do you mean? And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Spirit is born of spirit. Flesh is born of flesh. Spirit's born of spirit. Your spirit needs to be born again. Now, in the church, we've latched onto that. We have used that phrase, born again Christian, right? I mean, how many of you have heard that for the first time just now? None of you, right? Born again. It's, it's terminology in the church. It is what we use. But here's the thing. We forget to do it. We forget to allow God to transform us. It's a new birth. It's a new life. It's a new hope. It's a new relationship. See, so many times I've seen it as well, and I've even probably, to some degree, tried to experience it myself where I, I, I want to confess a sin to God, I want to submit to His way, but then when God really tries to change that, I don't want that change. I'm not quite ready for that. And we resist the transformation process of what God is wanting to do. 
In this passage of Scripture, God changes Nahum. He changes him physically, yes, he heals him, but he changes him spiritually where Nahum is now understanding that there is one and only one true God. He has seen how God can work. And in our own lives, we need to understand that as we seek God and as we uh, submit to His way, that God wants to transform you from the inside out. He wants to make you a new creature, a new being. Paul talks about how we were used, to, in Romans, how we used to be slaves to sin, but now we, we can be slaves to righteousness. And that takes place when God transforms you from the inside out. But even that, I would argue, comes down to us submitting to his way, letting him mold us and craft us and fashion us, that we would just have that heart for what God's heart would be. So as I'm wrapping this up, I just want to say, maybe, maybe you're sitting there going, you know, I want to be in right relationship with God. I want to seek him daily. I want to, I want to know that I have found him and that I'm in right relationship with him. And, and, I, and I want to say that if that's your heart, don't question on whether or not you're there, because guess what? If you have that heart, you're in the right direction. You're moving there. Don't beat yourself up. But also, when God presses in on your heart and says, I need you to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. I need you to go talk to this person. I need you to share in their grief. I need you to give them words of encouragement. I need you to come alongside them in their addiction. I need you to, then we need to submit to his way and not come up with reasons why we're too busy or someone else is better equipped for that or this person can handle it so much better. We need to submit to him. But most of all, we need to allow him to transform us, that his way of thinking, God's way of thinking, becomes our way of thinking. That we start to have that compassion for those that God has compassion for, that we would see the hurting and the lost around us and want to do something about it. Because you know what? God sees the hurting around us, and he absolutely wants to do something about it. He wants someone to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. He wants someone to share the good news of forgiveness and grace to someone who's never heard it or never heard it in the right way. And maybe that's you. And so we need to allow ourselves to be transformed from the inside out. And that transformation, when it is full and when it is complete, it impacts other people as well as yourself. So in closing, just simply, let's seek God together as a church. Because his promise is true that when we seek him, we'll find. When we knock, the door will be open. Let's, let's submit to his plan and his direction as a church and as individuals that we would find who he is and submit to what his plan is because his ways are better than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And let's allow him to transform us, to make us new. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to be the person I once was. Prideful, arrogant, judging. That's not any kind of a good life. I want to be transformed by him. I want to be made new. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for just the fact that it, it, it's absolutely true that you don't just give us your scripture and, and say, there you go, deal with it. But God, you sent your Holy Spirit to dwell in us. You sent your spirit to, to guide us and to encourage us, but God, to show us the right, even in the midst of our own struggle, you've not left us alone. You never leave us, you never forsake us. Matter of fact, you give us this promise in, in 1 Corinthians ten thirteen that that there is no temptation in our life, that you have not already provided the way through it. And so we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And God, help us as your sons and as your daughters to walk in, in your truth. Walk in obedience to your word and to find you transforming us from the inside out. We give you the thanks and we give you the praise for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.